welcome back to the stage, Bob Brown. Good morning, everybody. Hey, our, our next speaker, honestly, you say this about many of our speakers, but really, Nick Pope doesn't need an introduction. Um, he, as you all know, has been involved in the UFO field for decades now. His involvement began, interestingly enough, as you again, as you all know, because he worked within the gathering of UFO information and the analysis of UFO information actually for the government of the UK, the MOD. So what a, an incredible foundational base to come into the research and the study and the yearning for some truth about this thing we call the UFO phenomena. Nick is doing an incredible job of that. We all know him. He's going to be with us in a moment. Now, the Rendlesham Forest case is arguably one of the most important cases of, of all time. And Nick is going to bring us some new evidence and some fresh insight into this most important UFO event. Ladies and gentlemen, a big welcome, Nick Pope. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you very much, Bob, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Paola, of course, for putting on this Congress. And also uh, thank the people who are working so hard behind the scenes to make this event a success, the AV people back there, the people at the front desk. So thank you. A lot of work goes into putting on something like this. People like me, we just have the easy bit. We just go out and speak for a bit. Uh, they asked me, by the way, whether I wanted a uh, lapel mic or a handheld mic. And I said, you know what, I'm going to take a handheld mic so I can channel my inner rock star. <laughs> Good morning, Laughlin! <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's quite enough of that. <laughs> Rendlesham Forest is, I think, probably in terms of name recognition, a case second only to Roswell when it comes to this subject. And it's my fervent belief that if we're not there yet, certainly in a, a couple of years' time, You'll be able to stop someone in the street, and if you say what happened in Rendlesham Forest, uh, they'll know. And I think uh, Roswell so far is, is probably the only case like that. But Rendlesham is kind of getting up there, and uh, one of the things, of course, is that Roswell is now nearly 70 years in the past, and sadly, most of the primary participants in that, the witnesses, the players, have now passed, whereas with Rendlesham Forest, they are still with us. And that, certainly when it comes, for example, to putting together a TV documentary, is hugely attractive to producers and directors and writers. And I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but is it just me, or is Rendlesham hardly off the TV these days? I mean, I have seen that case portrayed in so many different shows, and uh, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, where are we? Okay. That, by the way, is an actual photo in Rendlesham Forest. It's not just some generic forest picture that I stole off um, Google Images. That's, that is ground zero, or, you know, that's, that's where it happened. Now, I'm not necessarily today going to tell the whole story from beginning to end for a couple of reasons. Firstly, time constraints, and second, I know a heck of a lot of people here are familiar with the bare bones of the case, but for those that aren't, don't worry, I think it'll come out 
through the course of, of this presentation. Now, I sometimes describe Rendlesham Forest as being almost the perfect storm of a UFO case. Almost everything that you could ask for in an incident is rolled together in this one series of events. A multiple witness sighting over not just one night, but three consecutive nights. Witnesses, the majority of whom were serving United States Air Force personnel. A UFO that was tracked briefly on military and civilian radar systems. A UFO that left physical ground traces, and we'll come on to a bit of that. A case where there is an audit trail of documents, the authenticity of which is not in dispute. There are a whole bunch of documents with some cases out there about which there are controversies and, and some degree of doubt. All the government documents on Rendlesham Forest can be read on the British government's own website. They're available at the National Archives. There's no kind of MJ-12 debate about are these things real or are these things fake. They are absolutely 100 verified genuine and you can take that to the bank. So all these factors came together in this one particular case. It took place, as many of you know, in December 1980 in the United Kingdom at two bases, Bentwaters and Woodbridge, which were, as I say, on British soil, but operated by the United States Air Force, part of the wider US presence in the UK. And I just want to briefly go through a couple of the locations just to, just to show you some of this visually so that you can get a sense for this. This is the iconic, infamous perhaps, East Gate where strange lights were first seen in the early hours of December 26, 1980 and where security police and law enforcement personnel first saw the lights thought initially that perhaps a light aircraft had crashed in the forest and started a fire, sought and obtained permission to go out into the forest to investigate, to essentially launch a search and rescue operation, and encountered not a crashed aircraft, but a UFO, and not lights in the sky, but a landed structured craft. It's worth, I think, my just trying to give a little bit of geopolitical context about this. I think we often hear about the Rendlesham Forest incident without perhaps hearing so much about the backdrop against which these events unfolded. And I think that sometimes that's important in trying to come to a better understanding about perhaps why this happened. December 1980 was an interesting and I think transitional time. The UK had comparatively recently elected a fairly hardline Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who was to take a stance, an aggressive, bullish stance with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact that had perhaps not been taken since the days of Sir Winston Churchill. And in the US, of course, um, just a month before Rendlesham Forest, Ronald Reagan had been elected as US president, had yet, of course, to be inaugurated. But it was very clear to everyone 
that this new double act of Reagan and Thatcher was going to fundamentally change the, uh, the, the political state of the world. And we were going to be in new and unfamiliar territory. And against that background, some very interesting things were happening in Poland. The trade union solidarity was rising in power. And without wanting to go into too much of the history of that, at almost exactly the same time as the Rendlesham Forest incident unfolded, the Soviets had sent a message to the puppet communist regime of General Jaruelski in Poland, and they'd said, if you don't nip this trade unionism with solidarity and Lech Walesa, if you don't nip this in the bud and stamp down on it, we will come in and do it for you. The Soviets had a regular military exercise called Soyuz. And Soyuz 1980 was scheduled for December, just a couple of weeks before the incidents of Rendlesham Forest unfolded. And many historians now believe, looking at the, some of the declassified documents that we have under FOI, that Soyuz 1980 was actually going to be the cover for a real Soviet operation to come across the border into Poland and suppress the trade union. Had that happened, that might have triggered a third world war. And I think that's very important. I'm not going to go into any more detail in that point, but it's important, I think, to uh, have that background in mind. And the Bentwaters Woodbridge bases, these twin bases, and they are so close together, uh, just, just about a half a mile, separated by Rendlesham Forest, that they are treated as a single entity in command terms. So you sometimes hear people refer to them as the twin bases of Bent Waters and Woodbridge. This facility was one of the most strategically important military facilities in the entire NATO alliance. And even now, today, 30 years on, I can't go into the full details of what the strategic mission of that base was. Uh, we know and it's a matter of record, of course, that it was the headquarters of the 81st Tactical Fighter Wing. They flew A-10s in the event of international tension and TTW, transition to war. Those A-10s would have been deployed to forward operating bases in Germany. And their mission would have been tank busting. Uh, conventional doctrine was that in a non-nuclear war scenario, the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, would simply roll tanks westwards over the border and just by force of numbers seek to overcome NATO. So the A-10s operated by the 81st Tactical Fighter Wing and others would have been a key part in stemming the Red Army in disrupting the flow of those tanks, but if numbers had proved decisive and if backs were up against the wall, there were other options. And many of you will have heard the rumors about the Bentwaters Woodbridge facility. That is a shot of the, the weapon storage area there. And people always ask this question. Were there nuclear weapons at Bent Orders Woodbridge? And some people have gone on the record with statements about that. Others won't. I'm not a whistleblower. I worked for the British government for 21 years. I do take my security oath seriously. It, bound, it binds me for life. So even though I've left the government, it, it uh, 
still holds me. And I checked the other day. I uh, reached out to the Ministry of Defense press office and I said, look, this question comes up from time to time. There is a certain answer that I give. Now we're nearly 30 years on. Is this just a little piece of Cold War history about which perhaps I can get into a little bit more detail? And they told me, no, the line on this issue is pretty much what the line on this issue has always been. And you can read there the statement. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> so, I can't really comment on that, but I think you can draw your own conclusions. And I think there are plenty of other people on the record out there who have decided to, uh, shall I put it this way, to relax their security oath somewhat. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's get to some fun stuff. <laughs> Some of the key players in all of this, John Burroughs and Jim Peniston, seen there with Linda Moulton Howe. And I just want to impress on you how much hard work is, goes into writing books on this subject and how serious everyone has to be. And, um, you know, just that's that's just a shot for you to show you what serious UFO research looks like. As many of you know, I teamed up with John Burroughs and Jim Peniston, two of the USAF witnesses at the heart of this, and we wrote a book. We collaborated on a book encounter in Rendlesham Forest, and this is us with Linda Moulton Howe, who of course, again, needs no introduction and is another great hero of this subject and has done so much uh, good work in relation to the Rendlesham Forest incident. And, and this is us hard at work going through our research notes there. But just in case anyone thinks that you never get any good times in ufology and there are no laughs to be had. I, I want to tell you that there are a lot of good times in this subject, and very often you see people looking much happier than that. <laughs> that is, of course, myself, uh, Jim Peniston, and Colonel Charles Holt, there and we just received word that Larry Warren was in the house. <laughs> Only kidding. One piece of uh, very new information that I, I want to share with you on this is that Colonel Holt, I don't know how many of you have been following his statements on this, but in recent years he's gotten increasingly angry, I think, about the way in which the authorities have continued to spin the Rendlesham Forest case as being of no defense significance, and I'm going to come on to that. But he's also gotten a little bit angry with some of the other uh, witnesses and some of the statements that have been made about this. and. Bob Brown mentioned in his uh, piece before I came on a uh, former police officer called Tony Dodd who did so much good work on this subject in the UK. It's interesting how many retired cops get involved in this subject and I think very often their, their kind of investigative mindset is very useful and can bring a lot to this subject. Well. Colonel Charles Holt has recently teamed up with another retired cop 
called John Hansen and has decided that after years and years of everyone else telling their side of this and, and you know, being interviewed briefly on various TV shows, Colonel Holt is finally going to just sit down and write his own account of what happened with this. And uh, he is collaborating with John Hansen on a book which has the provisional title of The Holt Perspective. And that book, I believe, will be coming out in maybe later this year, early next year. So watch out for that. Colonel Holt is going to uh, take no prisoners on this, I think. He's a, uh, you know, he's a fairly straight shooter. And uh, he's, he's going to, I think, uh, upset the apple cart a little bit on, on some of this. Um, I show that picture just, uh, just to show the serious side of this. Uh, I'm now going to show a picture just, uh, again, I mentioned that I teamed up with John Burroughs and Jim Penniston on the 30th anniversary of the Rendlesham Forest incident, John and Jim went back to Rendlesham Forest. And I think people sometimes forget how difficult things were before the internet, before social networking, before Facebook. For many, many years, uh, they had not actually uh, gotten together since their service. So. For these witnesses having a reunion, getting together, getting to uh, share their stories and experiences was a, a very interesting time. And one of the things that we did on the 30th anniversary was we took them back to the landing site. We wrote up an account of this for The Sun, Britain's best-selling national daily newspaper, and they wanted a, an account of John and Jim's recollections, and uh, that's, that's uh, Jim and John there, back, looking very pleased to be back. Uh, <laughs> just to tell the story of that photo, it was absolutely freezing cold. Um, I mean, it was record low temperatures, and uh, this photographer from the sun uh, wanted to get John and Jim out and uh, spend a lot of time with them and they were tired and they were jet lagged and uh, they uh, Yeah, they didn't exactly want to do that photo shoot as you might be able to tell from the expression on their faces But we did it and we got a write-up of, of the whole thing in Britain's best-selling national daily newspaper so again you know important I think to to kind of get this in the mainstream media when we can. What are we actually dealing with here? That's a sketch of what John and Jim encountered. Jim made that sketch in his United States Air Force police notebook. And you know, I think it's, it's always important to say that this, a lot of UFO cases are lights in the sky, and there's nothing wrong with that. There are some pretty darn spectacular lights in the sky case. But when something actually lands, when military witnesses get close enough to make sketches like that, and by the way, they took some photos too. Jim shot off a whole roll of film and then after he'd shot off his roll of film, then he started making some sketches. He took the film to the base processing lab, and the reason I can't show you any photos is the base processing lab then uh, turned around and said, I'm very sorry to report that your photos didn't come out. Hmm. Was it because the UFO was very, very bright? Was it because of radioactivity, or were those photos spirited away into some dark basement never to be seen again? I don't know the answer to that, but fortunately we do have Jim's sketch, 
And you know, when, when you look at something like that, there's, there's not a lot of middle ground with something, something like that. It's, it's not swamp gas. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not the planet Venus. It's not the light from a nearby lighthouse shining through the trees. It's, you know, it's, it's something tangible. About the only skeptical theory that really makes any sense when you come to something like this is the idea of secret prototype spy planes and drones. But, um, you know, again, sometimes you look at something like that and you say, it looks for all the world like something out of a sci-fi movie. And I want you to, to look at that image now. And particularly, whoop, okay, let's see. Particularly look at that, that little triangular bit there. And then look at this next, this next picture. Now, does anyone remember what sci-fi movie that's from? Anyone? Independence Day? Anyone else? Day the Earth Stood Still? Well, apologies. It's a trick question. It's not from a sci-fi movie at all. That's real. That is a, an unmanned aerial vehicle codenamed Tyrannis, named after the Celtic god of thunder. And guess what country built it? Britain! Hooray! <laughs> Rule Britannia. But that's just to show you the sorts of things that are being rolled out now. And here's an interesting thing, a couple of interesting things about that. Firstly, is it me or are they absolutely bending over backwards to push the spaceship in a hangar meme with the way in which they launched this? This is a promotional shot taken off the Ministry of Defense website. This thing was constructed by BAE Systems and developed as the next generation unmanned aerial vehicle. The other thing is, if this is the sort of thing that they're showing us, what aren't they showing us? Aviation technology, depending on who you talk to, generally runs 10, 15 years ahead of what's publicly declared. So if they're doing a nice fancy press conference and showing the world's media that, what aren't they showing the world's media? And for those people who believe in an acclimatization program, the idea that we're being perhaps prepared for some big announcement, well, you know, isn't that exactly the sort of meme that they would push. And by the way, when I asked the question, what's the next generation going to look like? I can actually give you an answer to that. Because again, here's an image that I took off the Ministry of Defense website just a few weeks ago. That's the next generation, an Anglo-French project to build uh, another craft. Now, again, you know, look at that and ask yourself a couple of questions. Firstly, the skeptical question. Well, if there are things like that on the drawing board, we should face the facts and, and certainly acknowledge the possibility that some not all, but some UFO sightings are going to be attributable to people seeing these secret prototype aircraft and drones. But again, if I want to go to the more conspiratorial, speculative 
side of this. Where does that technology come from? If this is the sort of thing that you can pull off a government website, you know, did, did we just come up with that or does it come from somewhere else? So for those of you who are fans of the idea that maybe we back engineered something from, from Roswell, these are exactly, I, say, I guess, the sorts of uh, things that we should be looking at. And, and how many people have actually seen those images before? I'm, I'm going to guess not a huge number of people. And yet, that sort of thing is freely available if you know where to look for it. I think sometimes with this subject, it comes back to something that I was taught in government, that sometimes the best place to hide a book is in a library. A lot of these, these things are out there, but they're, they're kind of hidden in plain sight. There is so much information on the internet, and a lot of it's pretty bad information, that it's very difficult sometimes to find the good stuff. But it is out there, and those two images, I think, are well worth your time. One of the other things that Jim Penniston did when he approached the craft was that he noticed strange symbols on the side. And that, again, is, is a sketch from his police notebook. As you can imagine, I don't know how many people here have ever gotten up close and personal to a UFO in quite the close proximity that Jim did, but uh, as you might be able to see from the somewhat shaky graphics there, uh, his hand was probably shaking while he was writing that, but he did then kind of uh, get back and write up a, a slightly better, clearer version of, of that. Now, you know, you can, you can go back to those images of Tyrannis and the, the other Anglo-French one, which I don't believe even has a name yet. And you can say, well, look, if somebody saw something like that, it would, wouldn't it, have on the side written somewhere, you know, USAF or Royal Air Force. And it would have the, the Royal Air Force logo, for example. It would not, I suggest, have something like that on the side of it. So where do those symbols come from? What do they mean? Is there a message in any of that? We'll, we'll come on to a little bit of that in a minute. I just want to uh, take a step back. I mentioned when I was talking about the geopolitical context of this, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher actually has a, a part in this story. Uh, maybe she has a big part in this story which has not yet been declassified. But a part in this story that we do know about is her meeting with a UK socialite and journalist called Georgina Bruni, who was a very good friend of mine and who some of you may know. And this is a, a picture of Margaret Thatcher with Georgina Bruni at a charity fundraising event. And Georgina asked Margaret Thatcher about the UFO phenomenon and specifically about the Rendlesham Forest incident. And Margaret Thatcher said to Georgina Bruni, you must have the facts right and you can't tell the people. And Georgina said, well, what do you mean by that? And Margaret Thatcher simply repeated it. You must have the facts and you can't tell the people. 
What did Margaret Thatcher mean by that enigmatic phrase, you can't tell the people? Did she, as some skeptics have suggested, mean, well, if people want to believe that these things are extraterrestrial or, or something else exotic and unknown, nothing you can say will dissuade them from that view. Or, as Georgina Bruni believed, and she was the one there having this conversation, looking at Margaret Thatcher's body language, listening to her tone of voice. Did you can't tell the people mean that was, there was some great, profound, possibly even terrible truth about this that Margaret Thatcher and other political leaders felt could not be shared with people? I don't know the answer to that question. I know a lot of people get quite angry when they hear statements like that and they say, well, that's not for political leaders to decide. It's for us as individuals to decide. Uh, you know, I don't want people saying to me, you can't handle the truth. I can handle the truth. And it's for me to make that decision, not somebody to make that decision on my part on my behalf, but I just, I just digressed with that Margaret Thatcher story because it's an interesting part of the whole Rendlesham Forest story. I mentioned, I mentioned that we have some declassified documents on this, and again, many of you will be aware, one of the biggest and most important UFO stories in recent years is the fact that the British government is engaged in an eight-year program to declassify and release its entire archive of UFO files. You've probably seen various interviews, uh, BBC and others, where each time a batch of these files is released, I uh, get interviewed and I, I talk people through some of this material. Uh, it's fascinating in a sense because for years the public position, of course, of the Ministry of Defense was that the UFO phenomenon was of no defense significance, quote unquote. And when we were asked about it, we consistently told the British Parliament, the media and the public that not only was the UFO phenomenon of no defense significance, but that there was very little time and effort spent on it, and uh, we just glanced briefly at the reports, but there was nothing particularly of, of any interest, no serious studies being done. And to date, this program to declassify and release these real-life X-Files has revealed around about 52,000 documents, some of which were classified at levels up to secret UK eyes only. 52,000 documents is not bad for a subject on which there's only a passing interest and, and you know, no real defense significance to this. And by the way, the MOD announced in June 2013 that the final files had been released. And then afterwards they discovered that they'd forgotten some and they'd found some more. So watch this space. There'll be some more files coming out uh, later this year, more likely 2016. But that is another story. But let's get into some of the documents that have been released and what they tell us about what happened at Rendlesham Forest. One of the most significant parts of this story is that we have so much more than just testimony. And I don't mean that to be disparaging. Testimony is hugely important. But if testimony can be supplemented with physical evidence, it takes us to a much stronger baseline for arguing our position. 
one of the things that happened in the Rendlesham Forest incident is, as, as many of you know, the UFO landed on the first night. It was seen by John Burroughs, Jim Penniston, and others. But it returned, actually, on a second night, and then on a third consecutive night. And on that third night, the witnesses included the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, himself. And he was told it had come back, and he went out into the forest, in his words, to debunk all this UFO nonsense, to put the story to bed for once and for all. And he saw the UFO too. At one point, he said it was flying around in the sky with speeds and maneuvers unlike anything he'd ever seen before. And this is a lieutenant colonel in, in the United States Air Force. And he said it fired a narrow beam of light down at the ground just in front of a team of men that he'd taken into the forest to investigate. And this pencil-thin beam of light struck the ground just in front of them. And Colonel Holt, looking back on this, wondered, was this a weapon? Was this a warning? Was this communication? What was this? He didn't know. He doesn't to this day. What he says is, whatever he encountered out there was clearly under intelligent control. He chooses his words fairly carefully, as you can imagine. But I think he's going to be a little bit more forthright in, in, his, in his book. Colonel Holt, one of the people, I mentioned he took a team of people out, about half a dozen. One of the people he took was Monroe Nevels. Monroe Nevels, amongst other roles that he had, was the disaster preparedness officer, and he took out with him a Geiger counter. Remember that John and Jim had said this UFO that they encountered wasn't in the sky. It was down on the, the ground. It had landed. Sure enough, when Colonel Holt and his team went back to that site, there were fresh marks in the ground where something, and it was, it was freezing cold, the ground was hard and frosty, and yet there were these fresh indentations. And Colonel Holt said, whatever this object was, it must have weighed several tons. There were three indentations in the ground that formed the shape of a triangle. The sides of the trees, this was in a small clearing, the sides of the trees facing the clearing were scorched and burnt. They were black. And when Munro Nevels ran a Geiger counter over the area, they found that radiation levels peaked in those three indentations and on the sides of the trees facing the clearing. And what you can see there is a direct quote from a defense intelligence staff assessment of those radiation levels. And you'll see the phrase, significantly higher than the average background. And that's from the government's own document. It's the, own, it's the British government's official assessment of all this. A few days after the Rendlesham Forest incident, General Gabriel flew into the UK from his headquarters in Ramstein, Germany, was briefed on the incident, took possession of a number of items relating to the investigation, and flew back to Germany. General Gabriel was CNC USAFE, Commander-in-Chief, United States Air Force in Europe, the senior ranking USAF officer in Europe. Why is he flying in to be briefed about a UFO sighting? And wait a minute, you might ask yourself, 
isn't the public position of the US government that we're not interested in this anymore. If you get in touch with the press office, if, you're, if you work for the Post or the Times and you get in touch with the press office at you know, DOD, NASA, wherever, and you ask about UFOs, you will be told this. We no longer investigate UFOs. We have not investigated UFOs since the end of 1969 when Project Blue Book was terminated, and there is no longer any official interest in this. If that's the case, why is the senior ranking USAF officer in Europe coming in to be briefed about UFOs? There is a disconnect there. And yet, surprisingly few mainstream journalists are even aware of this document from the Ministry of Defense's own file on this. Again, as I say, it's important to say that the authenticity of this is not remotely in dispute. You can read it on the government's own website. And, and there, not only does it talk about CNC USAFE, removing this, but you can see a little bit of marvelous British understatement. We were not exactly pleased that the general had taken this material back without sharing it with the Ministry of Defense and indeed without even telling us. But us Brits are very polite and, and uh, restrained when it comes to things like this. So uh, we, we tend not to be uh, too critical. All of this came up recently at the citizen hearing on disclosure, which many of you will be aware of, and some of you attended, and indeed participated in. An unprecedented gathering, the brainchild, of course, of Steve Bassett, who's here this, this weekend and has spoken already about some of this. This is a panel on the Rendlesham Forest incident, but um, Steve's vision, of course, was that uh, Congress should be looking at this issue, as indeed they have looked at it before, but not since the late 60s. But as Steve puts it, if Congress won't do its job, we, the people, will. So a mixed group of former congressional representatives, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, came together to take testimony and to conduct the sort of hearing that Steve and others believe Congress should be having on this, to hear from some of the government, military, intelligence community, aviation community personnel who have been involved in this, either as investigators or witnesses, and to say, what evidence have we assessed about this? Um, what have we amassed over the years? What is our assessment? And what should we be doing about this? And one of the most memorable panels was the Rendlesham Forest panel. And you'll see me there with John Burroughs, Jim Penniston, and the other person up there is Pat Frasconia, a crusading attorney who has given hundreds of pro bono hours on this case to help John and Jim get their military medical records. I don't have a huge amount of time to go into the details of all of that side of the story, and indeed, there are some medical confidentiality issues involved, which I intend to respect. But it is no secret, and indeed John and Jim have gone on the record in stating this, that John Burroughs and Jim Penniston have had some health issues which they attribute to their close proximity to this landed UFO. And yet, for many, many years, they struggled to get a proper diagnosis and treatment 
on all of this. Why? Because they could not access and obtain their military medical records, even a redacted version of it. So in the tradition of another great crusading attorney who's here today, Danny Sheehan, Pat Frasconia decided, I'm not going to take this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight this and go after these military medical records. So, for example, he used this platform at the citizen hearing on disclosure to make a case for this. And let me tell you what happened afterwards. I, I think sometimes I hear a lot of skeptics complaining that these events never really seem to achieve anything. The former congressional representatives who sat and listened to this panel on Rendlesham Forest were so outraged by the way in which John and Jim had been treated and were so angry that they were not able to obtain their military medical records that on their behalf they drafted and all put their name to and signed a letter to the Secretary of the VA and to the President of the United States requesting intervention in this. And I am very pleased to say that they now have at least part of their, their medical records. When the history of this subject comes to be written, perhaps sometimes we forget that it is people like Danny Sheehan and Pat Frasconia who, who often working behind the scenes are able to use their contacts and, and their knowledge to help move things forward. And, and certainly Pat was, was very involved with that. And, but he had a, an unexpected piece of luck which helped him with this. One of the most significant UFO documents of all time, I believe, is a declassified British study colloquially known as Project Condine. That's the front cover of the final report there. And again, at the time, it was classified secret, UK eyes only. Although a partially declassified copy has been released under FOI, large parts of that document are still blacked out. But um, Project Condine, I won't go into the full detail of it, but my job at the Ministry of Defense was to investigate sightings that really came in on a day-by-day -day basis. One of the things that we realized we hadn't really done properly was to do a proper intelligence study on this, to put together the data that we had amassed over the years and to ask ourselves, as you would do in any uh, say, national intelligence assessment. What are we dealing with here? Is it hostile? Is it friendly? Is it neutral? Uh, what do we know and what do we think? So Project Condine was put together to, to try and take that issue forward. And tucked away, and by the way, the, the Final report runs to about 468 pages. Like I say, there's quite a lot of blacking out, at least in some of the key areas. One bit which maybe they forgot to black out was that quote there. And you'll see the well-reported Rendlesham Forest slash Bentwaters event is an example where it might be postulated that several observers were probably exposed to UAP radiation for longer than normal UAP sighting periods. UAP 
is what we in the Ministry of Defense tended to use as opposed to UFO, unidentified aerial phenomena. And um, Pat Frasconia was able to take that quote from that declassified intelligence study, go back to the VA and say to them, hey, you know this incident that the US government said either didn't happen or if it did, it was of no interest. Well, look what I've got here. A British government intelligence assessment saying, yes, it happened, and yes, the witnesses were probably irradiated. The moment that document was put to them, they settled. It can be done. There are ways. By the way, when we were doing the work that led to the setting up of Project Condine, one of the speculative documents that, that really said, we need to look at this UFO phenomenon because we don't know what we're dealing with, but it, did, it set out three possibilities. And one of the, again, it's amazing to me that the mainstream media haven't really picked up on documents like, like this, but when, when they're hidden in the middle of 52,000 other documents, I guess it's pretty hard to, to find them and pick them out. But, but one page says, well, if we are dealing 